this gospel reading today about the transfiguration is so rich in symbolism and biblical illusions that I just thought it's worth almost reading it through with you um, carefully and slowly and making a few cross-references and then drawing out something from that. But it's really important to get the symbolism, otherwise we think the transfiguration is just about Jesus shining like the sun, which it, it is, but it's much, much, much more than that. We're in chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, and this is a moment of crisis for the disciples. They've had the first serious discussion with Jesus about the suffering that he is going to endure, <coughs> his passion, like us a bit, looking ahead to Holy Week. So they've heard this really difficult news that has thrown them and confused them, and he's also told them that they will be involved in this suffering. You will have to take up your cross and follow me. Crucifixions, suffering, passion, rising from the dead, cross. This is a moment of crisis. And it's exactly now that Jesus takes his closest disciples, Peter, James and John, up the mountain to be with him. So there's definitely something here about Jesus wanting to reassure and help his closest disciples disciples and companions at this special moment in their lives well look this is easy he takes them up a mountain okay lots of bells ringing here the mountain is the place where God's holy people go to meet him face to face the mountain of of Moses um, the holy mountains different mountains actually that appear in the Old Testament just as we were thinking about last week, this is a moment like Lent of going away, going to meet the Lord. So they're on the mountain, and interestingly in St. Mark's Gospel, the emphasis is not his face, but his clothes are transfigured. His clothes become dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleacher. And there's a general symbolism here, of course, of the divinity of, of the light of God that has appeared to so many Old Testament prophets and throughout Christian history but there's a very particular reference here to the prophet Daniel who has a vision of someone he calls the Ancient One, the Ancient of Days he sees through the veil into heaven itself and has a vision of God, of the divinity and it's the same reference the dazzling white clothes that the Ancient of Days wears. So for the disciples to see this, they're, they're making these connections that we don't make very instinctively. They're thinking, wow, this man that I have come to know, this rabbi, this prophet, he's more than a prophet. He's more than a teacher. He is God himself. And, and how they they make sense of this, well they don't that's the point um, but things are beginning to open up in this moment of crisis they see Moses and Elijah well maybe two meanings here um, Moses of course, re of course represents the law God's holy word, his teaching, his instructions Elijah represents the prophets and the prophecies so it's a way of seeing that the whole law and the teaching of the prophets is pointing to Jesus. So if we are having doubts about who he is, as Peter, James and John are, to be reassured that he is the fulfilment of the law and the prophets. This is our faith. But also, Elijah, remember, is the one who did not die, who was transported to heaven. And Moses is the one, it says in the Old Testament, whose grave could never be found. So there's just a lovely little hint here of Jesus, the Eternal One, who is with those who have gone to be with him. And in that sense, we feel that we're being given a glimpse on the mountain today, not just of who Jesus is, but of, of the future, of the glory that Jesus will share after his resurrection from the dead and his ascension 
the glory that Moses and Elijah already share with him and the glory that we hope to. Peter's confused. He's frightened. His mind is not working very well, no wonder. Um, and his reaction is to say, oh, this is wonderful. Let's build some tents and camp out here. Yeah? And again, this isn't just a, a, a silly human instinct. There's a reference here to the Feast of Tabernacles, where God's chosen people would build tents and camp in thanksgiving uh, in the desert and then in the Jewish tradition. So there's a, there's a sense of festival and feast day and wanting to be with the Lord. But the problem is that Peter wants to stay there. He thinks, we've had the talk about suffering. Now I've gone up the mountain to heaven and that's it. But the mountain is meant to help Peter and the disciples to face the suffering, not to take it away from them. And so the tents are not needed the shadow of the cloud comes down, another symbol of divinity in the Old Testament. And at last, God the Father speaks to the disciples. If you remember the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, God the Father spoke to his Son, but the disciples didn't hear his voice. This was the baptism of Jesus. It was a private, intimate moment for the Lord and those outside didn't understand properly what was happening. But now the disciples are ready and God the Father lets them hear the words that he only spoke to his beloved son at the beginning. They're, they're brought into this relationship in the darkness of the cloud and they're commanded to listen to Jesus. Listen to him. They've been listening to him already for months and months and months. They love him. But now they know they are listening to God's divine son. They've seen him. They've heard the father. The listening becomes different and deeper. And it's a listening that will take them to the cross. And maybe a phrase right at the end that you think is the least important, I think is the most important phrase in the gospel. It says, suddenly they looked round, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. In the English, only Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. But again, the point is, the Jesus that they are with now, walking down the mountain, who looks to be just their friend, their brother, this man, this companion, he is the same Jesus who they were with on the mountain and the truth about Jesus the light, the words the glory, they haven't disappeared they've just become hidden the truth of Jesus is the same and actually to look at Jesus and to see less is not to believe less you can hear all the other resonances can't you blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Okay. So just you see the wonderful connections. And you can do this by reading a Bible commentary. You can do this. And it's great fun. By getting a, a scripture. A, a Bible that has the cross references down the side. And just having a few minutes looking them up. What does this mean for us? Well just three simple thoughts. I don't really need to say them. Because they're. They're there in the scriptures and you can puzzle them out for yourselves. But look, there's, first of all, there's a doctrinal truth here, isn't there? What we believe. That Jesus is truly the Son of God, the Holy One. Son of God, not in the weak sense of, oh, we're all children of God, loved by the Father, which we are. But no, the unique, divine, beloved Son of the Father who shares absolutely in his divinity and his holiness with the Holy Spirit in the unity of the Trinity. The divine, unique, holy one, the Son of God. As the Father said, this is not any old son of mine, any old creature, any old creation, any old child. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. This is our faith as Christians. 
I know it's obvious, I know this is a hundred sermons at Christmas, but just to see our faith is in this gospel today. Lovely conversation some, with someone yesterday at the Cathsock training. One of our students, of course I'm not saying anything private about what he said, but just asking me about how do we talk to our friends about Christianity when they say to us, well look, all religions are the same really. What's the difference? How do you know one religion is, as it were, better than another? Well, I'm not going to use that language, but I said to him, it, it, it's not about necessarily having a knockdown argument to your friend in three minutes. That's maybe not going to happen. But to, to say to your friends, there's something absolutely unique about Christianity. Our belief, not just in God, or in his teachers, or his prophets, or his witnesses, but that God has become man. He has become a human being. He has lived amongst us, and walked with us, and we have seen his face in Jesus Christ. This is what makes Christianity unique, different. This is what makes Christianity a gift from the Lord, to which we are all called to know Christ. So there's something about doctrine and our faith in the transfiguration. There's something about, let me put it under the heading of sacraments, although I mean more than that. I mean, there's something about the presence of Jesus in all his glory, even when we can't see him glorified as the apostles did today. And I'm thinking first of the sacraments, of course, that in each of the sacraments, and especially in the Holy Mass, the Holy Eucharist, and in the Blessed Sacrament, that we meet the same Jesus. That phrase again, only Jesus. We meet, we meet only Jesus, but isn't it incredible that the only Jesus we meet is this Jesus, in all his glory. We might not have the same physical vision we might not have the same emotional or spiritual experiences that the apostles had but but it's the glorified christ that we meet in every sacrament and especially in the eucharist so as we gaze at, at the blessed sacrament on the altar today at the moment of consecration as you come to receive holy communion if you're able to receive communion today as you pray in the church before and after Mass, conscious of Jesus' presence in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Tabernacle, remember, it is no different for you, for us now, than it is for the three apostles on the mountain. It is no different. The same Christ, the same love, the same glory, just harder to see with our physical eyes. The last thought is, there's something here, obviously, about our spiritual lives. Yeah? Think of the, the ups and downs, the highs and lows, the lefts and the rights, and the ins and the outs that these apostles went through in this brief experience. Yeah? Suffering, joy, light, glory, darkness, terror, emptiness. We've all been through all of this at different times. It's, it's the journey, the map of the spiritual life. And again, the simple point here is, it does not matter where we are on that map, as long as we are journeying with Christ. Do you see? Of course we like the light and the glory, and the peace, and hearing the words. But sometimes we will be in utter spiritual darkness, Sometimes we'll just be bored and empty and lonely. Sometimes we'll be hearing the words of Jesus and excited about them. Sometimes we'll be utterly switched off and our mind won't seem to be functioning. Sometimes we'll be full of profound friendships and love with our fellow Christians. Sometimes we'll feel a little bit isolated and it's tough. But what matters is that wherever we are, we are with Jesus. We're walking with him. We're faithful to him because we know that he is utterly faithful to us. And of course we want more, and we want the light, but ultimately it doesn't matter. What matters 
like the apostles is that we are with the Lord